think that give that sense of purpose can't be underestimated, especially after service. You need to kind of find what drives you and, and gives you purpose to be able to move forward with your life. <laughs>
I had a cringe of, uh, you know, a bit of doubt, a sort of a bit of guilt when I um, realised, you know, I had him in the push-up position for a fairly long time there and I wouldn't have known how much pain he was in with his shoulder being in such a bad state. So... Oh, that's a credit to him and how you know yeah. his absolute champ attitude of getting through all that and making it to the end. Yeah, yeah, absolute champion. All of them. They were really impressive individuals. So yeah. It was a great experience and I'm very grateful to, for that opportunity. Yeah. Well if we jump back in the five to seven years in time before that, so you discharge in twenty fifteen and I want to talk about your journey sort of after that period, but for those who haven't listened to the podcast and to set the scene a little, I guess we talked about a great range of highs and lows in your service and how much you got out of it, how much you enjoyed, what was you've brought with you in that positive outlook today. But leaving was a bit of a rough patch for you there when 2013, uh, your first son is born. Uh, your father very sadly passes away from terminal cancer late 2013. The second son comes along shortly after that. So we've sleep deprived mother, family, uh, loss, grieving and dealing with your own, um, you know, baggage coming back from Iraq a number of years beforehand. It was a sort of rough window there and you discharged 2015. So what I'm interested to know is you've had this structure your whole life in your army career. You've always sort of known next deployment this or what you're training towards or progression or goals, opportunities. When you're out there in the civilian world, finally, after a long career there, how do you reset yourself and go, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm going to give myself purpose with this? How, what's the first sort of step you take to give yourself new direction? Yeah, it's a good question, Alex. And I think it's a question that all military people face, regardless if it's a voluntary discharge or if it's a medical discharge. So it is a, a difficult period um, if you don't have a clear idea of where you're heading. So for me, um, because I did have very young children and my um, partner at the time was still serving, I was, I guess, um, I, I kind of had to just go into this mum mode and sort of really quickly forget my military time. It, it really kind of um, didn't have that period of, of, of what I thought might be a normal transition of, you know, having a farewell, never got a farewell, never sort of, um, it was almost shrouded in a bit of shame because it wasn't the way I'd planned on leaving the military. Um, and I used, you know, becoming a mum as um, tr to try and make me feel like I had a purpose, but I felt very lost, to be honest, because I'd joined as an 18 year old. At that point in time, I'd served over half my life in uniform and yeah, I had no plan or direction. And it was a really, really hard time, like you said, and um, it didn't help my own personal circumstances with losing my father, who was my emotional mainstay. Um, the grief involved and then um, prior to that having already known I was dealing with PTSD but also trying to keep that really quiet from I guess any sort of uh, outer circle um, my closest family and friends knew but yeah it was just seemed like to the outside world my my bigger cohort that that I was um, leaving because it was that time to, to have children and do other things but it wasn't really the case so yeah, that, that part of it as well was very difficult to come to terms with and that feeling of not only grief for my father, but grief for the loss of my career was pretty intense, yeah. Because it's a core part of your identity that you have that you associate, I'm a major in the Australian Army, that is a key part of who you are and losing that sense of your job is part of your character and then how to redefine who am I actually without this big part of my life, it's difficult for anyone I think that loses a job they're really attached to, but when it is an all-consuming kind of job and your social circle and you give yourself purpose with your children, but in terms of actually then just looking back and taking care of yourself, I think it's fair to say that fitness is one of the things to really sort of help you take come out of that, you know, darker period and go to great lengths and you forward. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. I guess I, uh, at that period of discharge, I probably was at my least fit. Um, I'd been put on medication by a psychiatrist, um, which put on weight and takes away motivation. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, vibrating at my best sort of level. And so I guess people around me at the time recognised that and encouraged me to get into cycling. So it was, you know, not load bearing. 
um, dealing with some physical injuries as well. So I got into the cycling. Um, my mum and I went halves in a bike for me, which I still have now. Um, and that sort of got me out of the really, really deep depression I was in, got into cycling, did my first cycling event um, to raise money for cancer, uh, cancer research for my father's legacy, I guess. He, he passed away for, from cancer. Um, and then from there, it led on to me getting involved in Soldier On, who then got me to another level in the cycling by being able to go overseas and cycle in a pro-am event with Cadell Evans and, and our amazing comedian, Hamish Blake, who is an incredible cyclist in his own right. Um, and then, yeah, things just started to, to progress from there and evolve. And I, I kind of could see the light. I was coming out of the dark space I was in, thinking there was no future for me because I was done military. What was I going to do now? I, I'd failed. Um, but yeah, I put a lot of energy that I guess um, I'd been putting into my military career into this new found passion of cycling and it, it, rev it rotated on from there. So yeah, it's been a big, big, um, yeah, a big thing in my recovery, cycling. Because you have that discharge 2015 and you describe yourself as not being fit at the time, some injuries, but then over the course of, I'm not sure how many years, you become an Ironman athlete. What was the, when did you do your first Ironman event? Uh, I did my first Ironman event in 2017. It was a half Ironman event. I'd just done the Invictus Games um, with the Australian team and I'd been competing in cycling, swimming and track. So I thought I'll put these together. Now I've finished that part of um, my recovery. I'll, I'll go ahead and do this Ironman. It looks like a really hard thing to do. I don't know if I'll achieve it, but I've got to have a goal to, to strive towards. Um, so I registered myself for my first half Ironman and I qualified for the world champs in that very first event. Uh, call it luck, call it, um, I don't know, I was, it just ignited a passion in me to, to keep getting better at that sport. Um, and so I, I got uh, more into the cycling, running and swimming side of sport. And was that in the Sydney Invictus Games? No, that was Toronto the year before in Canada. So um, I did one Invictus and uh, again, another great um, springboard to get into another, you know, sort of circle of friends and group of people to get motivated and inspired. And yeah, it was a great experience. Well, talking about Invictus, you're surrounded by other veterans, people who have a greater level of understanding than any civilian in your life could of what you've experienced and sort of what you're going through. How important in those early years out of service was it to have that social network around you and from things like Invictus or just in your personal life? Yeah, I think that connection back to your military um, service is really important to sort of maintain. I mean, you don't have to go and join an ESO, ex-serving organisation to feel that, but just staying connected to those people who you served with is really helpful to give you a, a sense of um, you know, belonging still. And I think the reason why we have so many veteran organisations and, in, in, um, and initiatives like Invictus Games is because the military is such a unique line of work and that you really, it is a vocation. It's more than a job and it, it really does um, catch you off guard when you're no longer part of that. And to then be able to connect back into veteran services um, that give you sort of those connections and that um, motivation to, to try and find yourself again as a civilian. It, it's really important to a lot of people, not necessarily for everybody. Some people transition better, but for a lot of us, it is um, that feeling of, uh, I guess, of, of loss, to be honest, and that the people who you served with really get you and you've been through something unique together. So. So yeah, the, those connections back are really important to maintain and to find again, you know, as, as we find ourselves back in the civilian world and working out who we are again. But speaking of ESOs, you have worked with a variety. You're a soldier on ambassador and you've worked with Mates for Mates and Open Arms. Can you tell me more about some of that work you've done there? Yeah, for sure, Alex. The first experience I had with the ESO, ex-serving organisation, was with Soldier On when they sponsored me to do the cycling in Italy. And I 
became part of the uh, Soldier on Twice Tap team to cycle over and compete against other teams, other charities that were, um, you know, coming together to, to, to cycle for a good reason. Following on from that, I got asked to be an ambassador for Soldier On, which um, I still am five years down the track, which I'm very proud of, seeing the evolution of Soldier On and how they've adapted their services to remain relevant and um, providing support for those who really need it. Similarly with Mates for Mates, when I was living in Brisbane, I volunteered up there as a sort of fitness instructor and I ran, I ran trauma sensitive yoga. I did my teacher trainer because I found I hated yoga with a passion when I was serving and, and when I got out, I thought, this is not for me. It's too quiet, it's too bloody slow and I need to be moving. You know, that was really who I was. But the benefits after I really persevered with yoga and especially the trauma sensitive yoga that forces you to be mindful and go within your body because, uh, you know, a lot of that um, trauma that you do have and you hold on to from whatever that's happened in your life is stored in your body and so yoga is a way of processing that through the body mind connection and um, I found teaching yoga to veterans um, I was teaching Vietnam veterans who had lost limbs um, all the way through to contemporary veterans who had just returned from Afghanistan who were there for all their own reasons and that just that good energy and connection in the room was something special. So that's what I did with Mates for Mates and I missed that a bit. Um, then um, having moved overseas and then coming back to Australia, more recently I've been involved in the uh, local sub-branch of my RSL in Yass and um, I've been doing some things with them to try and help the veterans in my community to feel more connected. I ran a Veterans Health Week activity um, with the other members to get more people involved and we got some more members sign up in the community who had no idea that there were a bunch of veterans who got together regularly. And that's been good. Tonight is the annual general meeting for our little sub-branch and um, I volunteered to become the wellbeing officer. So I, I want to try and help other veterans who might be in a funk to try and push themselves to come out and maybe come for a walk or do some yoga or just go visit them. Um, in fact, we've got a 99-year-old World War II veteran in our sub-branch wow. who's coming tonight to the gen annual general meeting. Um, so I'm super excited to see him. He's been a bit isolated with the COVID in the last 12 months. Um, so I know I've heard he's really excited to get out and to the Soldiers Club tonight for the meeting. And his 100th birthday is coming up in two months. So we're organising a function for him to be celebrated and hopefully get his letter from the Queen. and. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's that real, I feel proud to know him, you know, he served in World War II. We don't have many of our, our older veterans oh. around anymore and we really have to celebrate these men and women who, who did our country so, so much service and um, honour. Yeah. I think you've discovered there sort of this, the multi-layers of ingredients needed to really foster well-being within oneself, especially whether the bouncing back from leaving something so a vocation, as you said, like the military or trauma, that you're looking after your body in the fitness sense. You're looking after your mind through mindfulness, meditation, practicing that yoga and looking deeper within the self. You're working on your social connections as well. The friends, both in the veteran circle, looking after other people and having a sense of fulfillment. And I think that social layer is just something that translates across all aspects of life, whether it's family and friendships and romantic relationships. Mm, exactly. And I think that's an important thing to talk about, Alex, is healthy relationships and especially not just um, with people around you, but with yourself. And if you're not honouring yourself and looking after yourself, then it's hard to have healthy relationships with those around you. And I've learnt that from experience um, with a, you know, a broken marriage, but, you know, I've learned a lot from that as well and and I've grown from that and it's so long as we go back inside ourselves and find those issues that we are harbouring and try and work on those parts of ourselves that make us um, who we are but also the parts that might be holding us back. So, you know, for a while there I was very fixated on my condition that I was diagnosed with, you know, it was really hard to move past, well, I'm Sarah, I've got PTSD. but you know, even though it might be a condition I have to manage my whole life, 
it's not going to define who I am. And, you know, I was ambitious and I was driven as a young woman before I joined the military and that's who I want to be again and that's who I'm starting to find myself back as. So, and it's through service to others, I guess, like you said, like the volunteering with various ESOs that gives me that sense of passion again and duty and purpose um, that that is cultivated during your service life. So I think if people, you know, who are navigating some difficult um, conditions from their service, it's not a life sentence. It's not a, um, it doesn't mean your life is over. It, it can be such a powerful thing to create growth in yourself and push you on to do even greater things. And that's what I hope to do. Even if it's only in my own little community sphere, that's okay. Like that, I don't need to go out and change the world. I just have to do the best I can as who I am um, in my community and with my family and my relationships. You don't have to think too big picture, just Sarah's world right now and those around you are all that matters. But you strike me as a very ambitious, purpose-driven person, whether it's getting yourself to the stage of competing as an Ironman athlete or Invictus, the fact your two gorgeous sons are starting today, their first day of year four and year two, respectively, <laughs> and all the mentorship and coaching and from a fitness level to a more holistic level you're doing with those in the communities. Um, and volunteering again as a well-being officer tonight, I think you've, it's a really inspiring amount of energy you have to give to other people. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that gives energy creates energy. That's been pro probably my my sort of MO since uh, even as a young girl, I, I was very energetic into sports, but also wanting to um, serve others through, you know, scouts or whatever and into the community. And and I think, yeah, I think that give that sense of purpose can't be underestimated, especially after service. You need to kind of find what drives you and, and gives you purpose to be able to move forward with your life and um, yeah I think I, I'm really lucky that I've sort of come full circle back to where I grew up here this is my home from when I was a kid and it reminds me how that before I joined the army you know I used to run up and down those hills to try and get fit to join the army you know I, I wanted to be the best version of myself I could and I think coming back here and raising my boys back in this environment reminds me who I am and and what life's about and yeah and what we can do in in helping others and serving others. I think your drive to serve others is very admirable and it extends just beyond say the veteran community. I now know you're moved on from that in a professional sphere and are now in a role that's actually giving you a wider perspective and allowing you to shall I say not move on from your army life but go actually there's also I can have two spheres here and I can be more than just in this bubble, but you've extended that reach. Can you tell me more about your current role? Yeah, I was really lucky to start a new job um, about four or five months ago in Yass. Um, we have an amazing um, company called Strategic Development Group who do, do a lot of work in the international development community engagement um, space. And uh, my first project that I, a couple of projects I've been working on are you know, something that really close to my own heart anyway from my own experiences in my life and that of being um, promoting gender equality in the Pacific um, where there's a lot of gender-based violence and, um, you know, opportunities for women are very much on the back burner. So, yeah, I'm, I'm involved in the, um, the project to increase access to gender equality in the, across the whole Pacific, which is super... Um, motivating. I get to speak with amazing Pacific women um, pretty much on a daily basis and seeing how they do things to, to promote um, women and girls as well as, you know, get men and boys on their side to, to improve the situation for everybody across the, the country in the Pacific. Um, other projects like working on a veteran wellbeing centre in Canberra because it's an area that is um, lacking, I think, and so we're working with a property developer in Canberra to try and get that off the ground as a project to in, ensure that there are the services in the one spot for veterans to come and access health, um, mental health, physical health and um, social connection opportunities. So yeah, I feel really lucky I've landed there. I get to pursue my passion of supporting veterans, but also see on a, a bigger scale how um, incredible, um, you know, Australian, 
influence in our region can be, like, you know, how we can improve that. I get to work with uh, experts in their field, modern slavery experts, climate change experts, and gender and disability inclusion experts. And like, you know, I've learned so much in my few months there from them who, you know, haven't got a military background whatsoever. And um, it, it just opens my eyes to a whole new world of what we can do to keep serving and contributing to the world for the better. I can see why you have so much passion to help your fellow veterans though, in a way, how would you help a past version of yourself as you were leaving and giving that kind of support? But another thing that's really admirable about you, Sarah, is how much you're willing to share your story. Why are you so willing to put yourself out there for people? Yeah, Alex, it is, it is um, important to me to share what I've been through for the greater good, to have um, not only people who are going through something similar, but people who might be on the periphery, who might be leading in the military now, um, who, who might be in the military and maybe face this in the future, um, to know that this could happen and the ways in which you can to manage it, um, there are different options. And I think the more people talk about it, the less mis mystical, you know, mental health is and military service is and um, being real, we're all human, um, to be able to talk about it normally without shame, which is what I felt a lot of before and I hid it from everybody. Um, there should, no be, should, should not be a shame around or guilt around why I left the military. It should be um, something that is part of who I am now and it doesn't mean that I'm not going to go forward and have another great career or be productive in my life. So I think that's the reason why it's important for me to talk about that. Having said that, it does take a lot of energy and it is, um, it, it does put you out there and open to criticism. Um, so yeah, I'm getting to that stage of where I need to sort of put myself and my health and my family first and probably not take on so many um, spokesperson roles um, as well. So yeah, there's finding that balance of, of, of getting it right. Well, we're always so grateful for your time and not just the time, but willing to open up and share. I think it's, um, you've got a lot of wisdom to share from your experiences and it's wonderful to see you now in the fact that you have so much support around you from family to other loved ones to a new man in your life. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I am really lucky to um, have such really good supportive friends, but also I've found a really healthy relationship with um, my new partner who himself a veteran um, who has just completed an honours degree in psychology so maybe that helps my mentality <laughs> um, but you know jokes aside he is very um, supportive of all the things I do and I think if you've got an ally who supports what you do in life then you know life's a good journey you know you want to be on the same singing off the same sheet of music and having that mutual support and respect I think is really important to have a healthy relationship and so yeah um, I'm looking forward to what the future holds and moving forward and, and taking what I've learnt from so far in my life to, to go on and do other things and do good things hopefully in the world. Well talking of learning from your life so far if you look back across your journey over the last five, six years, what would you say is one thing from transitioning from that military life to life after service, one thing that you did right and would recommend, yep, this really worked for me, it might be something conceptual or specific and something you look back and go, I wish I had known better or done something differently. Yeah, I think I'll start with the, what I feel like I was a good thing to do post uh, discharge was to take that leap of faith and, and get involved with an ESO um, who got me into sport, um, got me into the cycling and I haven't looked back from that sort of physical sport journey um, that's really given me something uh, I, I kind of like about myself, that, that achieving things in the sporting realm. You know, I've, I've cycled over 35,000 kilometres since I got my bike in 20, when I discharged from the military and, you know, that... That's I, I just I feel like wow like I would love to be able to cycle the distance around the world one day so so yeah just having those little goals um, getting 
that social connection with other people like-minded was one thing I did, I think I, I'd really recommend for people, but also glad I did myself. The other thing is uh, maybe that I could have done better um, was that I didn't really understand the, the um, DVA, the Veterans Affairs claims process, and I'm still going through that myself several years later down the track um, because um, it has been a difficult thing for me to do. Um, I think, again, going back to the shame associated with having to leave not on my terms, the, the recognition now that as I get older, I'm going to need that health support, I'm going to need um, access to um, those things that DVA can provide. Um, but getting a good advocate uh, who understands DVA processes would be something I would have recommended to myself you know, in hindsight, um, to be able to get that nailed down pretty soon after discharge because I'm still going through it now. Well, one thing that gave you a lot of purpose after your discharge was the fact you had George and David to look after your two young sons. As they get older, like I said earlier, year four and year two, they're starting today. How are you going to explain, I guess, some of your background to them in the military service and what it meant for you, what you learned from it and how it's shaped who you are as a person today? Yeah, good question, Alex. I guess my sons are kind of um, like any young boys, uh, very much into um, guns and you know, like games that involve shooting. And, there are some uh, Nerf water guns down the back there, <laughs> down the veranda. 20. Um, yeah, so I guess conveying about real time war versus, you know, what you see in the movies, what you see on, you know, internet, Fortnite, I don't know, whatever the games that they're playing. Um, the, the cost of war is much higher than just the glory of it. Um, and to me, educating them about, you know, what war is about, what the military service is about, um, is going to be a thing that I'm going to have to direct my energy to because I want them to really understand not only our um, amazing Anzac heritage, that, you know, our, I, I've got three grandparents who served in the military who I will want to talk to them about one day. Um, their father is serving in the military. Their uncle served in the military. I served. Um, so there is that deep military connection they're going to have. Um, and, you know, I can probably see one of, at least one of my sons joining the military just because of the passion he has for wanting to know more about the military and the army and what roles there are. So. Yeah, it, it's something I'll have to really consider how I approach it. Um, I'll be very honest with them and tell them about what happened with me and my service uh, in, you know, in due course when they can understand. Um, but yeah, I won't be, um, I won't be saying, I'll be always saying how proud I was to serve my country and um, that's something I'll reinforce to them as, as they are young and as they go on and get older. Well, Sarah, I think you're, really inspiring role model because you're not just all the positives, you had some hardship and you've come out on the other side, I think, stronger. You've achieved a lot. You are very driven and you're an inspiration to many people. So thank you for your selflessness in sharing your story, your service to others and for catching up with me again today. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks for doing this amazing Life After Service documentary and to Thomas and Rohan who support this initiative, the incredible thing you do uh, to, to, to give the Australian public this information. And, you know, I only wish, you know, my 99 year old mate at the RSL sub branch, we could capture his stories and, and you know, have that whole generation um, to share that wisdom and, and kind of experience that shaped our nation. So I really thank you guys for what you do. You've done a great thing. Well, thank you. And you said earlier that it was part of your formative fitness years running up and down those hills. I think uh, Rohan and I at least have to hit the, hit the dirt while Thomas chases us with the camera. So if you're willing to show us the ropes. Absolutely. And run some COVID <laughs> kilos off, we'll get to it. I'm up for that. Thanks guys, thank you.
When the shots crack around you, you remember the high. But it wasn't excitement, it was just terrifying. The steel tore through clothing, mud walls, trees and flesh. As I emptied my mag towards nothing at best. And as I crawled forward and I looked through me sights, I turned and saw Rowdy give a wink and a smile. He shouted with 